Thanks so much for having me. And I'm really happy to be here and see some uh, new and familiar faces. So um, I was also going to start with a land acknowledgement, so I'm really happy that you did that um, because really, um, because of the time where we're able to share the space together today, and it's really important that we recognize them. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to jump around quite a bit because um, my memory doesn't really work chronologically, it's more thematically, and I've done a lot of overlapping work simultaneously in arts administration and curatorial work, and I thought some of that would be of interest to people that may be pursuing arts administration and some people pursuing curatorial work. Um, and I think I've only really accepted that I've been a curator for about 10 years now because I started curating um, pretty non-traditional shows in very non-traditional spaces, um, which I still prefer because I, I don't really think the museum and gallery space as a venue for work is really that interesting. So um, yeah, I really look at the museum and, and my work as a place for the community to come together, a gathering space, a public commons, um, which has really been to the chagrin of many boards of directors that I work with, who I think perhaps would rather see people like them in their spaces. Um, and I think, um, you know, even my education was an attempt to come to terms with a lot of these class issues that I had that I think were so deep felt even through graduate school that I think it took me probably far too long to understand, accept, and acknowledge my inherent privilege as a white person. So I really think about that in all of the programming and curatorial work that I do. Um, and I believe I really came to work in museums because I had this like punk ethos of like, like let's tear down the institution from the inside, um, which is all well and good until you wake up one day and you're like, oh my god, I am the institution. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, uh, I still believe in upending the status quo and provoking the public. These are things that I really enjoy. And I think over time I realized that you can be in the institution, but not of the institution. So I really think about how I can use my role inside to change things about that institution from the outside. Um, so I really think of myself as an arts administrator first and as a curator second, but in both realms I have the same goals. I really want to um, educate people, I want to inspire people, and a word that I always shied away from for a very long time, um, I want to entertain people because you know, if people are entertained, they're going to return, they're going to stay, they're going to bring their friends. Um, yeah, so, again, I really don't think of myself as a curator in the traditional sense. I, I think more of myself as a curator of audiences and artists. Hey, guys, nice to see you. <laughs> um, providing artists and audiences opportunities and experiences. Um, and I want the values of the community that I'm working in to be deeply embedded in the work that I do in any institution. And I really struggle with how we can successfully do this in the face of a complex institution with various stakeholders, many of whom control the purse strings, but know very little about the values and actual work that the institution does in the community. Um, so in an effort for me to like think about these questions, um, I'll sort of start with a little bit of my background and how I got here, because um, people are always interested how I got here, and I, I still kind of don't know. Um, so like when I was a senior in high school, Antiques Roadshow uh, hit the airwaves, and I was like obsessed with it. And um, you know, not only with the idea that you have something valuable lying around like you didn't know about, but that there was a job where people determined value, that was like so bizarre to me. So I read as much as I could in high school about the value of art and objects, like how one little thing or an artwork could be worth so much, and who are those people that get to determine value. And when I went to college, I'd never even gone to a museum, um, nor even you know, like naively realized that art was a thing that was like still being made. Like I thought art was made by dead white men in like these musty mausoleums, I mean museums, um, where you go and it's like, oh, it's, it smells dead, it looks dead. And um, so I didn't feel like even know like real artists existed. Um, 
like I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, and um, yeah, so um, so yeah, um, <laughs> I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Like I didn't really have much guidance or like any like real role models for coming to art, but. I remember having this conversation with my mother. She was like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I just want to be around like interesting and beautiful people. And she was like, study our history. I was like, and I want to be on Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> I like really wanted to be on Antiques Roadshow. So, uh, so yeah, so she was like, study our history. I was like, okay. I've never been to a museum, but okay. Um, <laughs> so um, it wasn't until college that I had like my first art history class in contemporary art and it like totally like changed my life. Um, like my professors at the time, many of whom like I'm friends with and they're like my colleagues, they always talk about how like intimidating I was because I was like this like punk with like like a spiked dog collar and like black makeup, like sitting in the front row, like asking and answering all the questions. Like you just need to chill out, right? So um, and I remember like I'd really try to like expose my friends who grew up like me, like my punk friends to art and um, you know, trying to get people like me into museums. And um, I took them, like, I, man, it was like so embarrassing. So um, I took my friends to the summer solstice event at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. They used to do these yearly events. And um, my friends like broke out in a huge brawl. <laughs> and it ended the series, they never did the series again because my friends like just started this huge fight in the museum. And it was like really embarrassing for me, and a huge bummer because it was like my favorite event, and I couldn't go to it anymore because like my friends started to fight. But it really, um, it didn't deter me for trying to get people like me who had not been in a museum or knew how to like act in a museum to go there, and like trying to find a way to give everyone a way to access art and build a relationship with art. So. Um, yeah, around this time I received a scholarship to study contemporary photography in Chicago. And I went around and interviewed as many artists as possible about their practice and their passion. And then I realized, like, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make supporting artists, like, my passion. That was, like, so amazing to see people making work. And I just wanted to make a career out of, like, hanging out with artists and musicians and filmmakers and fashion designers because I just really still, like, I'm in it because I love the way artists' minds work and how they think about the world differently and, like, the receptivity to things and new ideas, their confidence, like, even their egos. Like, I love all of that. Um, sometimes. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, yeah, so flash forward a number of years, I, the day I moved to New York, um, which was, like, this whole nother, like, crazy thing for me, you know? And um, grad school is a really miserable experience. I don't know how your experiences all are if you're in grad school, but it was like the worst experience of my life. And I think that I still hadn't really like come to terms with my class issues. Like everyone there, like their parents were like doctors and lawyers and professors. And like my dad was just like a truck driver in the Midwest. And I like didn't like speak the way that they did with their big words. and. So, um, like, it was the first time in my life, like, I really started to believe that I was, like, less than these people, and, like, when, when I was younger, like, people would, like, call me white trash, I really had this idea that, like, I'll show them one day, and then I, like, went to grad school, I was like, oh, these people are better than me, like, <laughs> it was really hard, um, and I was also just, like, in the wrong department, I was in a really... I went to Columbia, I was in this really traditional anthropology department, and I really felt like I was being studied, like I was being othered, and I had to take one of my professors aside once and tell them to stop staring at me, so it just like made me so uncomfortable, like the fact that I had to do that was like totally nuts. So, um, so I finished grad school as quickly as possible, I worked at like a ton of places in New York, like literally by the time I left New York, I'd worked in every single borough of New York City, which was crazy. Um, but the first position that I truly felt like I had purpose was when I was the director of grants and community programming at the Staten Island Arts Council. Um, I was really able to encourage and develop artists and help them realize their dreams and projects. And you know, I was able to organize my own exhibitions and events. I met you guys in Staten Island. Staten Island. Yeah. 
Um, and it's really the first time I was ever like publicly called a curator. So like I didn't think it was never a title that I wish to put on myself. So um, I think I have some slides here. Yeah, let me show some things. Let's jazz it up a little. Okay. Um, so this is like one of the first things I organized. I don't know if you know Mary Mattingly's water pot project, but um, so I worked with her on this and I curated um, all of the public programming for this. Um, so we did like performances and music and readings and community workshops and you know, as you can see, it's a non-traditional space. It's literally um, a space on the water. Um, and yeah, this was situated at Atlantic Salt um, on the on the waterfront of Staten Island. And around, around the same time, I also curated this uh, video and performance exhibition using shipping containers as the as the physical structure at this 30,000 square foot um, space called the New York Container Shipping Terminal, in Staten Island. Yeah, here's like a little model of this. That's baby me, baby change. Mm -hmm. um, but this is sort of like what it looked like. And so we used the the um, shipping pallets as sort of the structure for creating these spaces for videos and performances. And this was, I mean, it was 30,000 square feet. It's like a huge space. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, <laughs> but I pulled it off. Um, so, um, you know, my master's thesis was really a study in how like we could take these industrial spaces that had produced physical products and used them to produce ideas. And so I sort of took this, this very like theoretical thesis and put it into practice as a curator, like using these industrial spaces like Atlantic Salt and the shipping container terminal as these experimental places to present experimental work um, like this. Um, so this is actually the first show that I feel like I was like truly proud of. It's a video and performance festival that I founded called Lumen. Um, the first year I curated, this was also at Atlantic Salt. Um, so yeah, uh, I had a really good connection for getting these containers since I'd done the project at the shipping container terminal. So I was like, I'm gonna do stuff with shipping containers. Like way before it was like super cool. But yeah, I like got all these free shipping containers. So I was like, great, I can like have videos and performances in them um, along the Staten Island waterfront, which was actually quite beautiful at night. Um, so yeah, I formed this rapport with Atlantic Salt, having worked with them on Mary Mattingly's water pot project. So that I convinced them to let me host this site specific uh, video performance festival. This first year, I had about 50 artists, and I think we got like a thousand people to come um, from Staten Island, which is like quite an accomplishment <laughs> in a town that's like stuck 50 years in the past. Um, and it's just a six-hour event. It was just like one night, and then it was gone. What year um, was this? This was 2009, so 10 mm. years ago. Just a mere 10 years ago. And then the next, this oh, this is also from uh, that first year. Um, it was awesome. Um, so the next year I curated a different location. Um, this is from the next year. Um, at, also in Staten Island at this abandoned waterfront complex that um, collect, it was all these sort of crazy houses collectively known as the Lighthouse Museum. It's all developed now. But um, this year I had like 100 artists and we got like 10,000 people to come, <laughs> which was crazy, mostly from like Brooklyn and Manhattan like crossing the river on a ferry, which was like one of the largest attended events ever in Staten Island for like a contemporary art event. That was uh, pretty crazy. Um, but I really felt like I had found my purpose as a curator. Like I really loved facilitating not only these opportunities for artists, but for audiences to engage with performance in more site-specific settings. Oh, here's a video of this, uh, or a video installation there. Um, yeah, so, I love the work I did in Staten Island, and it was like this really transformational time for me as a person and as a professional. I met my husband in Staten Island, I met um, my best and closest friends there, lots of really great people. Um, but it was also the first time I realized how horrible people can be. Um, I got like a lot of death threats there and a lot of hate mail. Um, I had to have a police escort me to work. and. A coworker was fired for punching someone in the face, defending me, all because of art. Like it's like that's how powerful art is, right? Like it brings people together, but it also tears people apart. 
Like, it's Staten Island. Like, forget about it. Like, it's crazy. Um, so, like, aside from doing compute, community programming like this in Staten Island, like, my primary job there was really to do community outreach and to encourage artists to apply for grants. So, like, my first year there, applicant pool, was like, we had, like, 50 applicants. And then it went to, like, 350 applicants. And then, like, it doubled from there. So, of course, those people who had relied on this money year after year, like, assumed I had rigged our grant panels. Because, you know, like, people applying couldn't possibly be from Staten Island. Like, I was doing something nefarious, right? Because that's how Staten Island actually works. So they thought, like, I clearly was doing something like that. Because, like, that shit happens there. Um, so, like, I was investigated for misappropriating government funds. <laughs> and, like, you know, I was in, like, my late 20s. It was, like, a really traumatic experience for me. And, like, there was a town hall meeting held with, like, 400 people in attendance. And I couldn't even go because I was, like, advised by, like, the police and my lawyers that, like, there was, like, someone who might shoot me. <laughs> like, all over, like, $2,500 grants for art. Like, artists. Like, it's crazy, right? So I had, like, friends recording the proceedings so I could, like, listen to it in real time. It was crazy. And there was this moment where there was this one guy talking about, like, how he was pissed that I was helping un oh no, this person was talking about how, like, oh, I was doing great work. I was helping these, like, underserved communities. And this guy stood up and he was like, how dare she give money to the undeserved? He literally thought underserved was undeserved. <laughs> and so, like, that really says something, right? <laughs> like, about that mentality there. Um, I think it's, like, the craziest thing. Um, so of course, with like this, like 400 people in attendance, about 375 of them were there to support what I was doing. It was a very vocal minority, um, and they were just really upset that I was opening up like Staten Island to like the greater world, the greater art scene, bringing people and communities together. Like I remember at the time, like Lost was really popular, and I was thinking like there's this like idea of like oh my god, they found out about the island, move the island, like they wanted to like move Staten Island someplace else where like you couldn't find it, right? Um, like, this island mentality is real, and I've encountered it in places like that are not only islands, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just trying to get them like caught up with what was happening culturally in the world. So, um, after the initial trauma of that experience, I really became grateful that it happened to me earlier in my career so I could better navigate um, you know, the tricky world of egos and money that are seemingly very inherent in the art world, as I soon learned. Um, so after this, I left, uh, I did a couple things. I was the director of a place called Art Connects New York. Um, and I was really drawn to working with this organization because their mission was presenting uh, site-specific contemporary art installations in social service organizations across all five boroughs of New York, themed around the mission of those organizations and really developed with direct input from the clients those organizations serve. So, you know, I was working with, you know, LGBT centers and foster care organizations and, you know, uh, organizations serving people with disabilities or people living with HIV and AIDS. It was just like really, like, such meaningful work. Um, and I learned about them because I was also, you know, simultaneously doing, like, independent curatorial work. I had curated an exhibition for them at the International Rescue Committee working with refugee and immigrant artists. And I also curate a show at um, New York City Industries for the Blind, uh, working with artists to create new works for an audience with various levels of sightedness. Um, I think I have, I wish I, I like didn't document my work well back in the day. Um, as a curator, I didn't think it was important. Um, now, I, now I do that. This was a piece by uh, Philip David Stearns. It was a light and sound uh, sort of strobing uh, installation. Um, from that New York City Industries for the Blind show. But really, like, doing that show, it's when I started to think more seriously about, um, like, the full community and visitor experience. Like, I hate the term visual art. Like, I don't like seeing it anywhere because I'm just much more interested in work that is not primarily visual and, like, exploring the ways you can have a relationship to art if you can't see it. Like, what do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel inside? Um, so that became my primary approach to curating going forward. It was really just all about the audience and how they would experience a space. Like I geek out on things like sound lead or how an exhibition looks and sounds from like an obscure corner of the gallery. 
um, what the first impression of a show is, what it looks like, you know, from the back. Like, I really spend a lot of time in the space and think about how people are going to engage in that space and that total visitor experience. So, oh, I'm talking too fast. Breathe. Um, <laughs> I got a lot to say. Um, so, after Hurricane Sandy hit in uh, 2012, it was like one of those moments like the 2008 financial crisis that really changed the art world and you know right before the hurricane I was at this moment where I thought I would just get out of working at nonprofits and open my own commercial gallery space like that would somehow be easier um, like I had a gallery name I had a website I had a roster of artists like I even like I had people that wanted to invest money I had the space that we were going to my husband and I were going to sign a lease on um, November 1st 2012 but that never happened because Hurricane Sandy came and flooded yeah. the space. <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't move into it because I would have lost like everything, like all of my money, my will to live. <laughs> like, it was just like, I mean, it already did that for me, but it really gave me this opportunity to rethink and regroup and reprioritize and figure out what I wanted to do. So, you know, like a lot of people in New York after that happened, um, I moved to California, you know, really changed the art world. All these people left New York and, and moved to California. You guys did it too. So, um, you know, I think leaving New York was the best thing I ever did for my art career because I think you become extremely short-sighted in New York. You think, like, New York's it. And I left, and I remember literally driving across the United States like, oh, there's art and, like, life and, like, things. And, like, when you're there for so long, you're like, you're so in it, um, and not in a good way. So, um, yeah, most people I know moved to LA. I decided to move to San Diego. Um, <laughs> great idea. A town. <laughs> yeah, you know, my husband lived there in the 80s, and he warned me in this way. Didn't quite understand that like everyone in San Diego thinks they're an artist. Um, so I came to San Diego to be the executive director for a small and completely unknown organization called the San Diego Art Institute. It was 75 years old, and the organization was founded as the San Diego Men's Art Club. <laughs> yeah, exciting. And very little had really changed between the time that it founded 75 years ago and when I got there. It technically wasn't an art club anymore, um, but it definitely was for people who enjoyed like landscapes, seascapes, and bowls of fruit. Because um, you can't find that anywhere else in San Diego. Um, so I was actually surprised that I was hired for the position because I came in and told them point blank like everything they did sucked. Um, I was like, your website sucks, your exhibition suck, no one's coming, no one's giving you money. Um, I mean, they were on the brink of closing and after firing their previously long-term director under pretty shady circumstances. So the board hired me to make the organization a place that I would go to. They literally were like, make it a place you would go to. Great, okay. Um, so while they seemed committed to change at that time. <laughs> it was then that I learned that change means a lot of different things to different people. Like how much change, how quickly. Um, like I think it's hard to ease people into change. I'm much more interested in like ripping off the band-aid and like moving forward. Um, not to say that I'm implementing changes in a bubble, like far from it. So like every decision I make is done with the full like buy-in and input of the community we're trying to serve. Like, I spend a lot of time engrossing myself in and endearing myself to these communities that I live in. Like, I find out what people want from their cultural organizations, what they would change, what programs they would like to see, what activities would draw them in. So these changes are made with like community buy meant to serve like a more diverse and larger demographic. But, um, but yeah, I learned people fear change, didn't know that. Um, <laughs> I find it exciting and inevitable, but there's a lot of people who definitely don't like it. I also learned that when you're trying to be more inclusive, there's a whole bunch of people that suddenly feel very excluded. Um, those people making those seascapes and landscapes and bowls of fruit, they weren't so happy. Um, <laughs> and they weren't happy about me like opening our doors to artists. Uh, they definitely let me know. Um, and it wasn't just about me opening my doors to artists, it was the kind of artists, <laughs> where they were from. Um, it was very clear that they did not want artists from Mexico showing in their space. I mean, they had a very narrow view of what art should be. Um, I even had employees like who had been there for a long time with a very narrow idea of what we should be doing. I had an employee say, like, you can't mean to say we're going to start showing performance art here. We're a visual arts organization. 
<laughs> I was like, okay. I mean, I let him go, but I gave him like this history of performance art to like better contextualize why we're showing performance art like at a museum space. Like, where do you think they do it? Um, so, like, I thought I was leaving this like mobby Staten Island place, but San Diego was not much better. I mean, it's a conservative military. Board. Is anyone here from San Diego? I might say some negative things. No. Go I'm, ahead. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's conservative, it's a military border town, it's like hiding in plain sight in this like liberal state, as really is this geographic dead end of the United States. Um, you know, I found it to be this place where people couldn't hack it anywhere else, they ended up like there's a lot of con artists there, and people who'd rather be like surfing than working, and yeah, I'm sorry for these vast generalizations. Um, but it did also have the highest suicide rate of any U.S. city between 1910 and 1930. There's this really great essay called The Jumping Off Place that details this fading romance of the American West and like the people that literally go to California to kill themselves. It's worth reading. Um, you know, San Diego is a city that's home to a high number of cults and fringe communities. But it, I think it also suffers largely because of its proximity to Los Angeles, right? Why invest in culture? in San Diego when you just go to LA, there's like plenty going on, right? And I would meet people who lived in San Diego for decades and had never even crossed the border to Mexico, which was just shocking to me. It's like living in Manhattan and not going to Brooklyn. I mean, that does happen too, but it was like so, like I couldn't believe that people live this way, right? Um, so, yeah, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, so this was like, I looked at this as my opportunity to really engrossed myself in another culture, another country. I spent most of my time working with artists on the US-Mexico border. You know, my weekends in TJ going to shows and exhibitions and dinners and cultivating community there because I really thought like that's where, you know, this is how this organization's going to grow. You know, I learned just enough Spanglish to do studio visits and transported lots of art and other questionable items across the border. Um, <laughs> I mean, the original mis mission of SDAI was to serve living artists of the San Diego region, so I just expanded this to serve contemporary artists from Southern California and Mexico. Like, I don't really think that's like a mission drift at all. It's actually broadening our base more and serving a, a wider and diverse artists and audience base. Um, needless to say, a lot of um, older white men <laughs> started coming to my office to like scream in my face. They harassed me in public. They even started picketing and protesting outside our front doors of San Diego Art Institute. They wrote letters to the mayor to have me removed from my position, like crazy stuff. I got some really good examples of hate mail here. Um, <laughs> so this, yeah, this is great. <laughs> So this is like one hilarious memory I have. Yeah, this is great. It's on Elephant Station. It's so scary. Yeah. Yeah, what does it say? Yeah. Bring back paintings. Signed a fan of the way it was. <laughs> These are two separate things. This came with a letter too, but I just I really like like there's different color markers. There's like some pen. Like this is thought out, right? Was the elephant part of it? Oh, oh yeah, this is the stationery it came on. It's so scary. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's this one hilarious memory I have. Like this guy was literally in my office screaming in my face because I wouldn't show his like stupid magnets in our gift shop. They're like dumb magnets, and it was like my birthday. We were supposed to go to the Price is Right this day. And I called, I had to go to work instead, and this, the, you know, this guy screaming in my face I was like, why didn't I just go to the Price is Right? <laughs> and, like, while he's screaming at me, like, my staff comes in with this cake, like, <laughs> you know, tentatively coming, this guy looked like a total asshole. <laughs> um, actually, this one on the elephant stationery, I named, like, the next exhibition. Sinking, sinking, sinking. I don't even know what that means. But um, I made copies of this and handed it out at the opening. So I think it's good to like sort of take back power from these people. Yeah, so here's a few of the shows that I did there. This is um, the show is, is part of this post mediations of biennial Beyond Limits. Um, this is like the first show that I did there. Um, we have Blaine de St. Croix, uh, Pablo Helguera here. Oh, this is the scary fiber art show that that person didn't like. It's so scary, right? It's like a show about, oh, there's Kat 
Katya's work. Yeah. Uh, show about gender uh, and, and fiber art. Like, bring back paintings, please. <laughs> so scary. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel really proud of the work I did there. I really transformed this organization in three years from this members only art club to an experimental contemporary art space. Um, I had an option to sign a three-year contract to stay there, um, but the day after the election, Trump, um, we were like, I, I made the space open for free so people could come in and like make uh, signs for the Women's March and just have the space for people to process. And I had a couple of board members uh, who were very upset that I did that, and they said that we shouldn't support political protests. I was like, it's not a political protest, but um, so I really decided to leave. I felt like I'd done, you know, everything I'd set out to do. And honestly, I'm really fond of like interim work and like making the hard changes and then being like, peace, your turn. Um, <laughs> like I do not shy away from obviously hate mail and death threats and stuff like that. Um, and I really love the art community of Southern California. Like I made amazing friends and colleagues. And um, yeah, it's a place that I'll always be close to. And I loved, you know, the access to Tijuana, the artists there, um, working with artists on the border, and you know, their openness to share their work and their culture with me. But there was this like lingering, stupid, <laughs> romantic idea of running a contemporary art museum that I just couldn't ignore. So um, I relocated to Tucson to be the executive director and chief curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art because I thought that's what I was supposed to do, right? That's what you do. Um, but yeah, I was super miserable. <laughs> I mean, I thought grad school was bad, right? So yeah, very soon after moving to Tucson, I realized I made a huge uh, mistake, you know? I know that it was like this thing that people think, like, it's supposed to make me happy, and um, I just realized I didn't want to work for an institution anymore, especially one where like that institution you know like the the people in power views that institution as like a playground for like their rich white friends right um all while ignoring this like diverse community that that institution is situated in and supposed to serve um and it's really hard when you uproot your entire life and do something that everyone thinks is amazing and you allegedly work your whole life for and you're like completely depressed. This got really sad. Um, <laughs> yeah, I felt like I just like had no way out. Like made this major life change. It's like, oh, I made my bed and now I'm just gonna die in it. Like die in Tucson. I kept saying that like whole time. I was like, I can't die in Tucson. <laughs> um, it's this like it's this physical and cultural desert, right? You know, it's like really there's not a lot going on. And after San Diego, I just wasn't mentally or physically prepared to like yet again carry like the whole weight of a city's contemporary art scene on my shoulders. I just like, I couldn't do it, you know? Like I did it as best as I could, but I just, I didn't really have it in me. I'm very proud of the work I did in Tucson. And I can, you know, recognize that I was given the opportunity to realize that a lot of these projects that I've been working on for a long time in a space that's like really cool. Um, so we'll look at some of those. I'm reminisce fondly for a little bit before I get negative again. <laughs> um, yeah, this is uh, the first show that I curated uh, there. Um, it was called Nothing to Declare Transnational Narratives. And it was a further development of a lot of the work I was doing with artists on the US-Mexico border. Um, and a lot of my initial draw to Tucson um, was to better engross myself in the border community and to work with indigenous artists. I thought, you know, I really wanted to get to know that geographic region more. So, um, yeah, when I opened this exhibition, I had a board member who thought we shouldn't show any work that was political again. And this was after I was hired, just a week after Trump's election. I thought largely because of this really great discussion we had about how museums couldn't afford to be apolitical spaces. Great. And then I do, a, like, it's not even a political show. It's a show examining the realities of living and working on the border. Like that, you know, whatever. Um, so, but this board member, he wasn't just upset about, like, this show. Um, he was upset, we got in this huge fight because there was a, a child in our after school program. We would do these programs of, you know, themed around the shows. Um, and we had this homeless trans teenager in our after school program who drew what he perceived, what this board would perceive to be an offensive image of Donald Trump as the devil. 
Well, yeah, without even considering for this child, absolutely Trump is the devil, you know, of course. Like, this is supposed to be a space for these children to express themselves in a safe environment. And, like, I just think it's, like, horrible when institutions react to politics this way and, like, how children are feeling. Um, and I think if a contemporary art museum can't address politics, it has no business even existing. If museums shy away from controversial material, we can't have a space for critique, right? So, um, well, here's another piece from the show. This um, this, intro, this artist is really great. Uh, Miguel Fernandez de Castro, he paid a, a coyote with his artist fee to smuggle these three bricks across the border from Salsa Bay. Um, and they, he gave them like uh, cameras and uh, other stuff. And so only one of them made it. And uh, like one day I was going to work and this brick was just wrapped in like a dirty shirt outside the door. But the other two didn't make anything. Like, this is a guy who goes across the border three times a week with people with drugs and other things. But yeah, we got one of them. Um, but it's really about like the absence, right? Like what happens to everything else, right? Um, yeah, this was a great show I did with uh, Victoria Fu about how technology is controlling our physical movements in space. And something that really stuck with me um, is how Victoria said this was the first time that a museum ever paid her. And I really view her as like, oh, this is great artist who shows a museum all the time. She said this is the very first time she'd ever gotten paid. And that really stuck with me. <laughs> um, I did this show, yeah, with Fokker de Jong. He's been one of my favorite sculptors for a long time. It was great to have a venue big enough to show his work, so that was cool. Um, I started this mural program for artists of color. This is Amir Fala. He lives here in Los Angeles. Um, this is uh, some images from an exhibition I did called Blessed Be that I curated that stemmed off of a year of programming I actually did in San Diego based on the occult. I called it, this whole year is putting the cult back in culture. Um, so this show explored like ritual and spirituality. I got an opportunity to work with a lot of artists who I've been following for some time. Um, there's another view. This is Alison Blithley. She's here in Los Angeles. Um, including Castles and uh, Ron Athey and Archie Hawk. I'm going to show you a little clip from this performance. And here's some stills from this performance that we did. Um, ancillary programming for the event in the lung of the biosphere. Um, this is great. And several of you here over there. And let me see if I can do this now. i got to end show, right? And then go to yeah. the end show. Ooh. And then we'll do this. Okay, let's go back. Sweet spot as a curator. Like there was this moment right before that performance at the Biosphere 
where I was like standing out and looking at all of these people that had come to like the middle of nowhere Oracle, Arizona for, um, you know, for this performance. And I think it's one of the first, like few times in my career that I really felt proud about. It, the performance was great, but bringing these people together, like this unlikely audience of like goths and queers and academics and curators and artists and scientists, like all in this remote setting for an event that we didn't really give us a lot of information about, like people made the pilgrimage from like, there's people from Canada there, like that was so cool. Um, yeah, so this is another performance uh, that I did uh, in Arizona. Like curating performance art for me is really the most fulfilling work. Um, this was a performance that we did in the middle of the desert, began in the middle of nowhere in Arizona. This is Palestinian artist Hala Gerar, um, who created uh, this performance using an AR-15 assault rifle. We drove people out in a bus in the middle. Of, we didn't tell them where we were taking them, but they were going to really see. And you know, so they they were uh, they were game. So uh, Gerard, he was a bodyguard for Yasser Arafat and a trained sniper turned artist. Um, and yeah, it's really this interesting. You don't think like someone with this background is going to be like professional artist now. Um, but really, one of my regrets about leaving Tucson so soon was like this relatively untapped potential to do more performances in and utilize the desert landscape like it's so there's so much space there you know like i want to do more installations and performances there so hopefully you know something i can return to in the future i just feel like there's just so much more i want to do um this is the last show this is an image from the last show i did at mocha this is based on like several years of research around the history of 100 years of dazzled camouflage and art, music, and design. And um, this was exciting because I got to collaborate with like one of my favorite bands, OMD, I've loved them forever, and one of my teenage idols, Peter Saville, who co-founded Factory Records and like designed all the albums for like Joy Division and New Order. So like, that was amazing. It was like one of those like, uh, I got like really like fangirl. Um, but I think, like, the work that I'm really most proud of doing to someone was working with the education director, Eli Burke, and developing these meaningful uh, community and education programs, specifically for queer and trans youth and seniors, um, including our drag program. This, we had teen drag program and a, a senior drag program, and then we developed an intergenerational queer art studio called Stay Gold. Um, I'm trying to get them to come to Minnesota and develop our education program, so we'll see. Um, yeah, so just like in two years, I was, I was at MOCA for just over two years, but you know, I did great work there, like objectively, you know, I doubled our attendance, I doubled our income, like, but like my 200% was never going to be like remotely enough for this board of directors with a very narrow view of what we should be doing. And I was like killing myself over it. I was raising all the money, I was curating all the shows, I was doing all the public programming, community outreach, HR and admin. You know, it was like a three-person job easily, and it was just hard because my board didn't recognize or appreciate the difference between what the organization was and what it had become. And I foolishly thought that they'd wanted to like expand their visibility and outreach and like work with a higher tier of artists and do more critical shows. Um, yeah, like a few months before I left, we had this opening that was like one of our most highly attended events to date, and. Like, the next week we had this board meeting, the board chair said, you know, um, we're just not getting as many people as we used to at our events. Like, I didn't, I didn't know any of those people. I was like, yeah, I know, they're like new audiences <laughs> that I've cultivated. And she was like, yeah, but they're just families. I was like, just families? Like, are you kidding me? Like, we're doing something that like so many museums are trying to do and aren't doing and we're successfully doing it. Like." And the fact that I had to explain to like this developer like why it's just families who like buy houses in Tucson, like just families that, like spend money at their businesses, like you know, it's just like wow, we just don't see eye to eye in terms of our values. So you know, I'm the third executive director they've had in five years. <laughs> so the board, I'm trying not to be too negative here. The board has decided that they're going to collectively run the museum for a while. So we'll see how that goes. Seems like a great idea, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> they've also decided to retain my intellectual property for everything I just showed you, so um, that's cool. And for everything I developed while I was there that I haven't done yet, so 
Good times. Um, they actually just gave back grant money for projects that I developed and fundraised for because the artists pulled out because they aren't working with me anymore. Like, so there's a show that I've been working on for years um, with another curator working with female indigenous artists and all of these artists were like, no, you're not like curating the show without the curator. Like we're already like traumatized and tokenized enough and now you're not even gonna like compensate the cure. Like what is this? It's crazy. So like a lot of these museums don't understand that like this relation, like this business is about relationships. It's not about what money or whatever they, I mean, yes, it's about money, but like you can't be successful unless you develop meaningful relationships with artists um, and the community, or at least I believe that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's really led me to like where I'm at today. So like I very deliberately have tried to extract myself from the institution, to position myself in a space where like art and ideas like come more freely and I can impact more people over a sustained period of time. Um, where I don't have a board questioning why our galleries are filled with black and brown families that I've worked hard to cultivate and develop meaningful relationships with instead of just like hosting cool art parties for their hipster friends. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, like it was kind of a hard summer. Like I was pretty depressed. I slept a lot. Um, and then, you know, I uprooted my life yet again and returned for the first time in 20 years to the Midwest. Um, and I kind of said that this is like my last chance at like giving this art thing a go. Like, let's see if this will work and let's see if this will make me happy. You know, like I want to feel professionally fulfilled, you know, um, and if I'm not, I'm probably just going to like work at the zoo or something. Um, <laughs> I love animals, they're great. Start an animal shelter. Um, so now I'm at this organization called Franconia Sculpture Park, just north of Minneapolis. Um, I spent a lot of time vetting this organization before moving because I just don't want to make the same mistakes or naively go into something again. I feel like I was like catfished going to Tucson. You know? <laughs> um, and I had like three main criteria that I like and like made sure that the board was like ready to commit to before I would commit to them. Like easy. Like one, I said I only work with nice people. They have to be nice. Um, <laughs> that they had to really understand the importance and role that contemporary art plays in our daily lives and like really believe that and like live that. And they have to help me fundraise. Like they have to, I can't raise all the money myself. They have to do it. Like what, you know, do your job. So um, I also felt confident that the organization was committed to making the changes that they needed because like someone who I greatly admire, Sharon Loudon was on their search committee and so I was like, okay, well, Sharon's on the committee. Like, <laughs> it must not be so bad. Um, but they really were very vocal that they wanted to shed their, like, white male macho image of, like, big art. And, like, literally while I'm here this week, I have my staff going through the website and taking out any mention of the word big art and any photos of, like, white men welding, which there's a lot of them. We're going to very empty website. Um, <laughs> but, like... You know, we want to make it like appealing to like women, artists of color, and indigenous and queer artists to make work on site there. But like, you know, if you see pictures of white men welding, you're probably like not that into it. Um, but I'm back to it. Something I think like has always made me happy, which is running artist residency programs. This is the fourth artist residency program that I've run now, and I feel like I can just like I I prefer being like in this role, like I can be instrumental in the developmental stage of a project and support artists in creating new ideas, like that's, I think, much more fulfilling for me to like work directly with them at the beginning stage of like an idea or a project or going in a new direction. Um, so like right now we're like moving out like 50% of the work on site at Franconia in the hopes that it'll like free people to think about the possibilities of the landscape. Um, and see a space for themselves there. Like right now, I'm going through, are you looking at pictures of white men welding? There's a white man welding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I'm like, when I get back on Monday, okay. all those photos better be gone. Um, <laughs> seriously, like that's their mandate for the week. Um, so right now I'm conducting a full audit of like, there's 150 sculptures on 50 acres um, and figuring out like what we want to keep, what we want to invest money in restoring and what just needs to go. Um, 
but like most of the organization and the aesthetic was really steeped in one person, one very problematic person's uh, vision for the past 20 years. And I just think the organization needs to be more critical about the context of the work that's in the space and how it reflects the wants and needs of the community. Oh, here's a photo of the space. So, so okay, for example, like here's, um, here's a beloved sculpture at Franconia. So like, yeah, I believe it's like an aesthetically good work that's different from a lot of like the rusted steel Burning Man art that has pervaded <laughs> Franconia for so long. We're getting rid of all of that. Is it anything with like steel, anything with welded steel is gone by, by the spring. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but like, um, but like if we stop for a second, like, you know, this work is just like a reciting of the original Lorraine Motel sign where you know, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was killed on April 4th, 1968. So um, this work was made by Chris Larson. He's a white artist in Minneapolis. And it's already raised some concerns about how this artist can take on a project with so much meaning to the civil rights movement. When, I mean, of course, we've sort of seen how this has unfolded for like artists like Dana Schutz and Sam Durant, especially in Minnesota, which is much, <laughs> very mindful of these sort of things. So I'm not really sure how putting this sculpture in this specific place and time furthers any meaningful discussion around you know, civil rights and race, but like, unless there's some sort of public forum or activation around the work, I think that this work has to go. So this is one of the things that it's like, it looks great. Mm, let's dig a little deeper and like think about what this work is really about. Because um, I think what many people fail to realize, like once the artwork like, okay, the idea is fine, but once it leaves that artist's studio, it's removed from that artist, it's removed from, you know, their unique subjectivity from the place and time that it was made, you know, all of these works, you know, like this included is informed by this artist's education and age and race and class and gender, and the gallery, the critics, the museums, <laughs> the collectors, you know, and I think that the institution has to be this forum for creative expression by the widest cross-section of humanity possible, or we're not being successful stewards of preserving and presenting work for future generations. So right now I'm really thinking, like, how do we physically and metaphorically make room for new ideas? So this is what I always find that I'm tasked to do when I go to a new institution. I was hired, like my other previous positions, most of them to come in after a time of great turmoil and right the ship, so to speak. I won't say too much leading about the situation. Um, I won't say too much about the situation leading me to uh, going to Franconia, but I'll just reference uh, Jenny Holtzer's uh, iconic work and say abuse of power comes as no surprise. Um, it's also no surprise that as a young woman, I'm paid significantly less than the previous director, even though I'm acting as director, curator, and development officer. Um, you know, maybe I'm just a glut for punishment because I'm yet again in a position where I'm fixing an organization with deep-rooted sexism and predatory behavior, right? And completely flipping it to a place where uh, people feel comfortable inhabiting. You know, I'm mindful that if we as an institution want to be more diverse and inclusive in our institutional perspective, we need to support that diversity from within with our staff, with our board, with our artists and residence program, with the artworks, that we commission in the public programs that we do. Um, I want our diverse artists and audiences to see themselves reflected in all that we do. So, um, and there's just like, you're not compromising by support, you're not compromising artistic quality by representing queer communities and communities of color. And it's gonna make our programming so much better than what it is, like, yeah. Um, so like for example, one of our core programs is the sculpture residency for young emerging artists. And if those artists can't feel comfortable in the space that they're living and working for three months, that's gonna have real trickle down ramifications for everything that we do internally and externally. So um, as a side plug actually, we're launching our artist residency applications in a few weeks. So share with your friends. You don't have to well. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm working to make Franconia, like all the organizations I've been at, a more just and inclusive environment for the staff and the community at large. And this just can't be done without gaining the trust of the community that I work in. Um, and collaborating directly with the um, 
with the community to realize projects big and small at the park. And I think one of the truly exciting things that brought me to Frank County is the opportunity to have a free outdoor museum, particularly for a rural community that wouldn't normally go to the Walker or the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, we get 150,000 visitors a year. Like, and there's just a real opportunity to engage people with contemporary art, with demystifying the process and making it accessible. Um, I think there's a lot of exciting programming op opportunities in the space. Like we already have this built-in audience, right? So like, let's give them something even more exciting than just like big art in space. Um, let's bring a performance artist to engage with the work. Let's bring a sound artist to respond to the work. Let's have a hip hop festival, a dog park, a beekeeping, farmer's markets, whatever. You know, it's like literally a wide open space for new ideas. So I think that there's a lot of uh, opportunities there. Um, yeah, I truly believe that art needs to serve a greater purpose and our institutions need to be held accountable to upholding their missions instead of focusing solely on revenue generating initiatives as I was recently asked to do in my previous position. Like for me, there's a greater need to generate cultural capital than monetary, uh, than generating money for the institution. So, you know, I'm trying hard for once not to do everything right away at Franconia so I don't get burned out because as you can see, I'm a little burned out on the institution in general. Um, because personally, I think that the board model is incredibly broken and I'm just in conversation with my peers all the time about how organizations can move forward with a governing body that is so far removed from the organization's mission and values. Um, you know, I tried hard to develop community-minded boards and more diverse boards, uh, but no one really wants to be like the trailblazing only person of color on a board of directors that doesn't share their values, right? So, you know, I've even developed models where like the rich white people on the board could subsidize board positions for artists, for community members, and people of color whose voices we want at the table, but who may not be in a position to uh, to pay the board dues. Like, there's so many ways that you can go around this, right? Um, and I'm definitely open to discussions on how we can move these organizations forward, and so maybe some of you have suggestions you'd like to share with me. Because I definitely think there must be a way to change the nonprofit infrastructure. Like, for example, if I don't do my job, I'm held accountable, right? If, uh, ooh, that's cool. I didn't have anything else to show. Um, so yeah, like if I don't do my job, I'm called accountable. But if my board doesn't do their job or they go rogue, like there's no recourse. They can do whatever they want. Um, I know this talk was really supposed to be about like deconstructing the institution and um, yeah, get in there. Um, I mean, there's really nothing. Cool, thanks. <laughs> so, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, so this talk I know is about deconstructing the institution, but um, and I think that's really where I'm at in my career, thinking about these questions like all the time, um, especially as a curator, which I actually think of myself much more as a cultural producer or facilitator rather than a curator. Like, if I was going to curate shows that, like just I liked, no one would go. So, you know, I try and challenge myself as a curator to show work that, like, maybe I don't like or don't fully understand yet because, like, I know what will resonate with an audience outside of myself. Um, and I've seen so many curatorial endeavors that are so self-serving, and I try to, like, completely remove myself in this way that, like, maybe it doesn't even matter who the curator is. I don't know. Um, but for me, it really is developing these meaningful relationships with artists, with uh, you know, supporting them, listening to them, pushing them, providing uh, unique and important opportunities for them. Um, I mean, that's really why I got in this business, to work directly with the artists. So hopefully, in my new position, I will be able to do that. Um, and just like briefly, like I thought about some of these questions like that I know I had originally posed and I thought about what I thought I might talk about and I was like, I don't want to talk about any of these things. But it's um, <laughs> so like the things I would do differently, like I really believe in professional development and growth and I think that only with experimentation and failure can we figure out what works and what is successful and I think that earlier on I should have defined success on my own terms instead of what like society and like this profession 
deemed is successful. And I think that's an important lesson for artists to follow as well. I think you have this idea of what success is and you have to define it for yourself. Like, yeah, there's so many different ways to be successful. Um, yeah, uh, what else do I want to say? Let's see. Um, okay, so what would I like to see for museums, artists, and audiences? Like, obviously more inclusiveness, social justice, equal pay, uh, more women and people of color in leadership and board positions, paying artists well and fairly, that doesn't happen nearly enough. Um, and in my position in Minnesota in particular, I'm really looking forward to um, the opportunity to develop my relationships further with native artists and communities. Like we're starting a series of community convenes with different tribal organizations to develop a residency program specifically for indigenous artists. So I'm very excited about that. Like, what would Franconia look like if we gave back the land to the Lakota? Like, that'd be interesting. What would Franconia look like if we just did, like, feminist land art next year? We might. I'm thinking about it. Um, <laughs> I don't think people would be that happy. <laughs> That's the things that get me in trouble, right? Um, but those are the ideas that I'm interested in exploring. And, you know, in terms of, like, artists, I mean, I think that we need to see less ego. Like, I love like that artists have ego, and I think that you need to have an ego to be a successful artist, but you also need to like learn when to put it in check. I don't think people figure that out a lot. A little less maleness, and with all due respect, I love white men, I'm married to one. Some of my best friends are with them. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I do think that like this whole like macho, as you're like, you know, if Franklin was all like big art, like men make big art, and it's like, mm, I think we're over that, so. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to see more of an understanding of what contemporary art is and support for living artists. I know that's the job of institutions, but like when art has been taken out of the schools and it's not part of the curriculum, it affects our audiences, right? So like, you know, I just, I worry about the long-term ramifications of that. Um, I think like when you visit a museum and you see that like 90% of the artists are men and only 10% are like, women or queer folks, like, you should say something about it to the institution. Like, unfortunately, I think that the only way that will change the institution is if the audiences continue to speak up and call out the institution to help them shape what they should be doing. And maybe that's where the only real change will occur. Um, because I don't think it's with the boards. Like, which, it, frankly, I think are a lost cause unless, like, all of us join boards of directors. Like, that's the only way. <laughs> we're going to affect change. Like, we can't continue being naive about where the power lies with these organizations. It's with them, like, and so we need to be a part of that. Um, so hopefully we can collectively, like, reshape what it means to be an engaged art participant. Like, for me, like, I think about that all the time. Like, how can I be a successful leader or an arts patron or a curator? Um, and yeah, so, you know, the art world's a, a constantly shifting place, and hopefully we can you know, shift in the right direction and, you know, hopefully with all of you and your new ideas and your leadership going forward, we can, we can do that. So that's it. so wonderful for um, both the, the younger artists and emerging curators to hear from someone like you and see you as kind of a near peer that's made, um, accomplished so much. Um, I, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the circumstances of this. <laughs> because yeah. knowing, I've known Chris's work for a long time. It's very different, it's right? It's totally different. I mean, he's a white guy that makes giant, sculptures out of big pieces of wood and boats and things like that. So I'm trying to understand how this happened. Right? I am too. <laughs> and I've met Chris now that I've been in Minnesota. I think he's great. I think he's doing a lot of important work in community development. Like he just opened this artist studio and artist residency program. And he has a magazine too. He has a magazine. Like he's super involved and very supportive that I'm coming there. Like he was very happy to see like some of the things that we'll be 
doing going forward. I don't think he's going to be happy to know what I'm taking his. I haven't told him yet. We're taking this down. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what the actual history of the commission was? And I think that he proposed this, and the last director, who, you know, he's he, he was a white man who was a very, who he was he didn't know he, he you know like think of it's like so I I don't even know where to start. This is such a misstep, right? Like. If, if I had been there and Chris had proposed this piece, I would have really said you need to rethink that. This is not the place or the time for you to explore this. Like, I, I'm, it's well, great that you're passionate about this, but this is not the venue for this. But it's completely decontextualized. And exactly. And it is decontextualized. And after the whole Sam Durant thing, which, you know, was mind-boggling, and then they did this right after. I was and like, that's what it's going to ask Right you. after. I was like, no one had that discussion there. I mean, actually, people did. A lot of people on the board said, please don't do this. They knew it was a misstep, and the director went forward with it anyway. And I'm so surprised that more people in the community didn't speak up. People did speak up about it, but that it wasn't more of an issue. I think it got overshadowed because of the Sam Durant thing was happening like at the same time. Okay, because I teach a course called Art in the Public Realm, which I'm teaching next semester, and I, you know, a good part of what the class is about are, you know, really, you know, analyzing critically these, you know, missteps that you know you can trace a lineage of, you know, from tilted art forward. But this is crazy because the other thing that just happened. Yeah. I just can't yeah. believe it. It's just, Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a similar, anyway, I just want to find out when it was done and what. The same exact time, like okay. simultaneously. Okay, okay. Well, yeah. We'll talk offline about we will. it further. But yeah, I'm meeting, with, I'm meeting with Chris next week, and like, I want him to propose a different piece in its place. And to talk honestly about the circumstances of this coming, to, I'm like, great, like I. You should do some kind of symposium. As you are kind of rethinking these, things. like have the community come together and talk about it Absolutely. as we're taking this work down. Like, why are we taking this? Well, down? it's not unlike in a certain way, you know, toppling racist, uh, you know, civil war era statues. That I mean, you need I to, agree. you can create a kind of forum for discussion about it. It would be really instructive because I can't even believe in a place like Minneapolis, which actually does have a kind of, um, you know some story institutions, and some good politics. Yeah. Things, weird shit has been happening. So I think you'd be doing a great service. Yeah, I, we definitely talk about, we want to do some sort of community dialogue yeah. before it comes up to yeah. talk about this. Like, hey, let's come together, let's talk about, with the artists, like, why this came to be, why this probably shouldn't be in this place, and propose a new piece for this space. Yeah. Because you know? he's actually a really interesting artist. He is. <laughs> that could contribute something really very significant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, so, in my class, in my like, taking up history class with Professor Lin, and we've introduced the idea of like, artifacts that were like, stolen from other countries so many years ago and are now being displayed in like these exhibitions, mostly in like, Western Europe in, in the United States. And I'm curious to get your perspective on if like, you're curating the exhibit, do you choose to display those artifacts or where like should those artifacts be returned? Um, I know it's a heavy question, but just I'm really interested in getting Well, I'm not that type of curator, so I don't feel like I'm ever in a position where I have to like think about artifacts. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, we should give back the artifacts to the, the cultures and the people who made them, absolutely. Like, you know, we think about, like, even the idea of, like, museum collections is a very colonial concept, right? Like, we own your culture, we own a part of you. Like, we need to start thinking about those objects differently. Like, they're not a, it's a cultural asset, right? And I think when institutions think about it differently, yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, I personally would not be working with those objects. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless it was like in dialogue, again, like where you have this community forum, it's in dialogue with the communities that have made them, and there is some sort of understanding. I don't know. I, I just, I'm not in that world, so I don't think I'm well equipped to answer that, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, you're saying um, uh, throughout the talk a lot of site-specific things, like that, that key term, I think, from your yeah. talk. Um, why do you prefer site-specific art over more general art? Well, I think, you know, the, the place and time that an artwork is made matters, right? So, like, 
Like I was saying, when an artwork leaves an artist's studio, it's decontextualized already. This is decontextualized, right? So like to create a work, like a site-specific work for the space that's responsive to the landscape, to the people, to you know this specific time would for me be more meaningful. Like I want to see how artists meaningfully engage with the world around. I mean, I want to meaningfully engage with the world around me. I want to be just like a present person in society. I think it serves artists well to really think about these issues when they're making work. You know, and I also, I just, you know, I think it's more interesting to do work in locations where you can educate audiences about the people whose land that we're on or, you know, uh, important events that have happened in those spaces and you know, again, it's like you can educate people, you can also entertain them, right? You have an opportunity to do both. And yeah, there's not much you can do like in a space like this, right? I can hang some paintings, I can do an installation. I mean, there's things you can do, but it's it's confined. I want to like open up the possibilities and, you know, yeah. You have your hand up first. Um, I'm also from New York, so I'm interested in like, what you think about putting installations like this in big cities. Um, also, I guess that goes for Los Angeles or like Miami, things like that. Um, and is there a place for kind of like this kind of play with all of the limitations that cities like that provide? Yeah, there's a, a lot of limitations, right? Like there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy and money and government and yeah. Uh, yeah, public art is great, but a lot of public art is in private spaces. <laughs> like, what you perceive as public art is not really public. Like, it's something I'm thinking about now more that I'm in, like, Minneapolis, St. Paul. I live in St. Paul. And, like, there's this, you know, there's these, like, tunnels above ground. <laughs> like, so that in the winter. Skyways. Skyways, right? So there's these skyways where you're, like, above the ground. So in the wintertime, you don't have to go outside. All the buildings are connected. It's like a big hamster wheel. Which is kind of cool, but then you think about like the privatization of public space. Like you're creating this issue where like the economically like these businesses on the ground now don't have access to people, and now like public spaces like the street are now privatized, right? And you can control those spaces in different ways. Like, yeah, I mean the idea of public space. Well, that's a big question, right? Like. I don't know what's public. I mean, it's like, on one hand, everything's too public, <laughs> but then nothing that you perceive as public space is actually, like, really public. It's owned by someone, and, like, the idea of owning land and who controls it is, like, I'm not answering your question. Okay. I'm just, like, pondering more. It helps. <laughs> yeah, like, more public art, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think something that I've been grappling with in my own, as an academic work is, the question of like agency based on identity. So, for example, um, as a as a cisgendered woman, how can I speak on behalf of trans bodies or you know queer bodies, right? And how can that be taken seriously when I don't identify in that particular way? And I think that's a really difficult terms to navigate as a scholar, um, especially in critical studies. So, kind of like. I was wondering about your experience about with like curating for these marginalized groups when maybe you don't identify as a part of that. That's a really good question. It's something I think about all the time. I'm not curating for them. <laughs> I'm curating with them. You know, it's a collaboration. I'm not their spokesperson. You know, like they're their spokesperson. Like I'm creating a platform and a venue for the artists to speak about themselves. Like it's not about me. That's why I say about like removing the ego. Like it's it's about the artists representing themselves. And for me to say here, this is your opportunity for you to to for you to share your unique perspective. Like um, I think a lot of curators don't do that though. I think like I said, a lot of curatorial work I've seen is very self-serving and it is very much about the ego of the curator. I don't get that because I don't I don't really have an ego. I probably should have more of one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like it's hard because like I show a lot of like, you know, indigenous artists and queer artists and you know, I uh, obviously I'm I'm not indigenous, like I don't identify as queer. Um, all of my friends are. You know, it's like one of those things, like I can't speak for a, a, a group of people that I am not, but I can at least give them the platform to speak for themselves. 
and at, open up institutions for that. Like institutions need to be a, sport, a space where those voices are heard, right? Like these people's voices have been so silenced in our nation's institutions for so long that it is so important to me to make sure that their voices are at the forefront of what I'm doing. Like, we don't need more white men welding, right? Like, we've heard that. <laughs> heard it over, like, time for, for new ideas and new voices, so.